Hey everybody, welcome to episode 75 of the Masterclass. My name is Cam, his name is Dave, and we're back. We are back. We had two unscheduled weeks off. Yes. Which was very sad. Mm-hmm. But we have, we have overcome. Well, Dave had a meeting and I felt like garbage, so... <laughs> You know, it is what it is. Life happens. I was trained by the federal BI. The fe- <laughs> the federal BI. Federal BI. Is that like what you call it? You know, in the biz. Oh, they're uh, just the feds. That's what they're on the TV show. The feds are taking my case. I can't believe it. Oh my. I can't remember what federal BI is from. If that's from like raising, it's a. Thanks from Raising Arizona. Okay. Wow. We're going to Nicolas Cage's first movie. Was that really his first movie? I'm going to go with yes. This was a game show. I would say yes. I'm going I'm to go with Peggy Sue Got Married was his first movie. I've never even heard of that one. <laughs> so in my defense, it's the first movie he's done that I'm aware of. It has all the classic Cage elements. Yes, it does. Have you seen that SNL skit that Andy Samberg used to do? Oh, yeah. <laughs> How am I not in that movie? <laughs> he looks like him too. It's crazy. He did one with Nicolas Cage as well, which I thought was quite funny. Uh, okay, it is from Raising Arizona. Is it his first movie? Oh no, no, no! I'm st- I'm still on my thing. Here. <sighs> okay, so it's when they steal the babies. Nathan Arizona says, "I got the cops and the federal bi out there looking for my boy." <laughs> Everyone leaves micros and whatnot. Okay, so, sorry. And what is Nicholas Cage's real last name? Coppola. Yes. Why would you trade that out? What? Why would he trade his last name out for Cage? Oh, that's his first movie. First movie is Fast Times at Ridgemont High. What? Yes, and he went by Nicholas Coppola in Coppola Fast Times at Ridgemont High. So, let's see here. According to the Internet Movie Database, um, his first actual big screen appearance was in Fast Times at Richmond High. Then Valley Girl. Then Rumblefish. Racing with the Moon, The Cotton Club, Birdie, The Boy in Blue, Peggy Sue Got Married, and Raising Arizona. <laughs> all right. To be fair, of all of those movies, Raising Arizona and Fast Times at Ridgemont High are the only two that I've even heard of. And I've never even seen Fast Times at Ridgemont High, just Raising Arizona. We watched it in math class one day, because that makes sense. Mm-hmm. What was the year difference, though, between... 86, 87. He did all those movies in a year? Oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. 82 to 87. Okay. Fast Times Ridgemont High was 1982. Well, shoot. Yep. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, <laughs> episode 75. Here we are. I believe. Well, do you have anything that you want to say to our lovely listeners? Uh,. I would say, regardless of when you're listening to this, pray for the people of Haiti as Hurricane Matthew went through there today. And Can't that catch country break. is such a mess as it is that uh, level four is that what they call them? Level four? I can't remember how they exactly say it, but a four, something four. What's the Magnitude? That's the earthquake. Yeah. I don't know. Four Poseidons? <laughs> I I don't know. I grew up in Michigan. We didn't really have any hurricanes or tsunamis up there. Just snow and ice storms. And gang violence, but, you know. Yes. Not where I live. Category four. That's a category four. So. Anyway, slice it or name it. Not good. 
it is not good and it takes them forever to recover and particularly in that southern part of the island uh, hurricane hurricane rains will wipe out roadways and it could be months for them to get the roads back up and going there so yeah feel bad for them I really want to say something snarky just to play devil's advocate because I'm <laughs> feeling a little agitated about how some people might respond to that situation, but I'm gonna gonna internalize this, that anger and and not take this podcast to a bad place. And I'll plug Partners in Health. If you want to give money to Haiti, give to Partners in Health because they will continue to be there long after the hurricane is over. I'll put the link to Partners in Health in the show notes. It's Dr. Paul Farmer. So if you guys are interested in um, donating some money to help the long-term relief uh, for the people in that country, you can go ahead and uh, check out that link in the show notes for sure. And there's a good chance that the Bahamas will get hit. Uh, my daughter did a missions trip to Eleuthera, Bahamas last summer or last football, last spring. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of people that will probably be affected by this. Yep. All right. I think before we dive in, I want to chat about something. Oh no. No. Uh, <laughs> now that did sound rather for foreboding. <laughs> David, I've been watching you. <laughs> You're going to confront me. <laughs> it's time for Stop a recording. Stop recording. <laughs> it's time for a carefrontation. No, uh, I've mentioned this a while back. My wife is pregnant, mm -hmm. and I just did the math, and uh, yesterday was seven weeks until the due date, which, That's... as I was telling Dave before recording, it's like, holy cow, when did that happen? Uh, you know, because these things are always, especially like as the dude. Like, you can watch your wife become more pregnant, but you have no idea what it feels like, you know? Mm. And she tells me, and I'm like, okay, that sounds terrible, but, like, <laughs> there's there's this disconnect between, like, seeing it and organizing the house and painting the nursery and going to the shop and, like, all of that sort of stuff that's really spread out, you know, whereas my wife is living with it every day, and she'll, like, point at her, you know, her stomach and be like, oh, can you see her kicking? No, because I, I can't feel it. So I can't see the, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I can feel it, you know, when I put my hand on there. But uh, so I, I think uh, I had that, you know, yesterday and today was just like seven weeks is not a long time at all. No. I mean, it's it's half a football season, <laughs> but football is one of the shortest sports seasons as it is anyways. Um, and I was just thinking. You know, like, I'm a big tech nerd. I like, you know, toys. And so I, I, on on the the one side, I was, oh, my gosh, my kid is going to be here sooner than I know it. And that's that's exciting and also frightening at the same time. Uh, I think more exciting than frightening, but, you know, talk to me after a week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then the other side of it is, like, she's going to be born into a world that is obviously full of its issues. And who knows who will be president when she's born. Because um, the election will be uh. right around when she's born. She's due November 21st, and election day is usually... Isn't the election in November? Yeah, it's that first Tuesday, I think. Yeah, so we'll know exactly what America she'll be born into. Um, but on the flip side of the bad part of things, the good thing is like she's going to be born into a world where you can talk to computers... You can touch computers. Cars are becoming self-driving. And I think back to what technology was like when I was a kid. And uh, I just get really excited for what, you know, people in her generation are going to be able to accomplish with, you know, all of the technological advances that have happened in my lifetime. I just saw the other day where there's earplugs that interpret foreign languages. So contained in like little buds, 
I mean, smaller than, you know, headphone buds is all the technology to hear what's being said, make the translation, and then for you to hear it. Yeah, it's not surprising. Now, I, you have to carry another pair with you to give to the person so they can understand you in English. Yeah. But, which could get gross after a while. But I, I, yeah, I'm with you. It is truly amazing, everything that's going on. So, and I just have to clarify the election day. This is, this is crazy. It's not which Tuesday it is, per se. It is, it's the Tuesday immediately after the first Monday. So of course, it's not the of first, course it is. It's Why not, make something simple? It's not the first Tuesday. It's not the second Tuesday. It's the, it's the first Tuesday immediately after the first Monday. So this year, the first falls on Tuesday. So it's, so it's, an, it's the eighth. Yeah. <laughs> so dumb. So anyway, random, random information. Yeah. So anyways, I just... I realize I haven't, not that, you know, people listening to the show are eager to hear my thoughts on, you know, being a dad. More to come on that later. <laughs> uh, but I just thought it would be, uh, I wanted to at least share some of my, some of my uh, excitement, some of my trepidation um, about, you know, the timing and then kind of the state of the world in very, very brief terms, because um, we actually have something really uh, interesting to talk about as our main topic, so I don't want to waste a whole lot of time, but um, if anyone who listens to this show is a dad, stay tuned. We are working on something Mm -hmm. for dads that uh, I've had this idea, I want to say, for a year and a half or two years, but obviously, you know, I didn't have any children, Uh, and that's changing very soon, so... um, we will just uh, kind of leave that cliffhanger out there. But um, if you uh, are interested in that role, we uh, hopefully will have something for you in the coming months. We'll leave it at that. Sounds good. More information to come. I wasn't planning on, on doing a blind plug, but I did it anyways, Dave. I hope you're okay with that. Yes. Whew. All right. Make it work. <laughs> I didn't give any concrete dates. I said in the coming months. Yeah, no, I hate I was smart about it. Absolutely. All right. Will you do the honors? Yes. So we are at Matthew 21, verses 33 through 39. Here, another parable. There was a master of a house who planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and leased it to tenants, and went into another country. When the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first, and they did the same to them. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Wow. Those yeah. are some wicked tenants. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's, not, that's not a fun passage. But we need to discuss it nonetheless. So let's dive right in, shall we? Yes. All right. So we got this master who builds or plants his vineyard, puts a fence around it, digs a wine press, digs a tower. He pretty much sets the whole thing up mm-hmm. to be successful and to do what a vineyard should do. Uh, and then it says that he leased it to tenants and went into another country. So we've got a real estate mogul on our hands, right? He sets everything up, puts it in a tenant's hands, and then just leaves to collect um, the riches, as it were. Now, uh, when the season for fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get the fruit, which is his right, because he's the owner. Mm -hmm. The tenants are there just to maintain the property and, uh, you know, to make sure that it's lived in and taken care of. This is all, you know, very common even even today. May not be with a vineyard per se, but with an apartment, with a home for rent, you know, the landlord and the tenant. This is a very common relationship today still. 
So I don't think we're, we're at any point um, confused here yet. But the tenant, this is where things change. The tenants took his servants, they beat one, they killed another, and they stoned the third one. Mm-hmm. I'm assuming the one that got stoned died as well, but just a little more perhaps prolonged than the one they just straight up just killed. Um, so let's just stop there for a minute. Why in the world would the tenants kill the servants? Well, they let one live apparently, but probably to send back as a messenger <laughs> saying this is ours now. You left too bad. Like, what's their motivation for doing this? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, that, you know, kind of back to what I said is, it, it, I think there's just evil here. There's just, they're, they're truly um, wicked people. And I, I'm guessing there's, you know, kind of like what you were saying of they've done all the work, the owner's long gone. Uh, they may have, you know, through working this land and the harvest coming, kind of felt like they were owed something more than they really were. And we're certainly uh, focused on them and... Um, the material benefits that they would get uh, out of the vineyard. So, yeah, I just think this is just, um, it's, it's, it's evil. It's selfishness. It's uh, being sinful personified. Yeah, I would agree. And I think, um, the selfishness that you pointed out, and then you didn't say this word, but you kind of alluded to it, the entitlement that they felt like this was theirs now Mm -hmm. because they're the ones that had done the work. Um, Even though they didn't own it, they had no right to the ownership of it. They were brought in to work, not to, not to, uh, you know, uh, become owners. And I think this is a very um, telling parable about human nature. And, um, you know, we'll, probably talk more about this later as we get towards the end of this part of the passage. The, we're gonna, this parable actually goes on, I think, to like verse 44, but we're going to do that back half next episode. Yes. Um, just for you know clarity for the listeners. Um, but I think that this parable as a whole, um, and in particular this section, can really shed some light on, um, as I said, human nature and what our inclinations um, can be, um, not necessarily always are, but certainly could be. Um, and the idea that we want what we can't have, uh, we feel, um, that we have the right to things that we want, uh, and that we will do apparently in this case, whatever we feel is necessary to keep what is ours, even though it was never ours to begin with. And, you know, you can extrapolate this line of thought to um, how we feel about money, how we feel about power, how we feel about being in control, uh, how we feel about, um, you know, uh, being judging other people but not letting them judge us, Mm -hmm. uh, that sort of stuff. It even comes down to, you know, what my rights are and what you can't do to me and and the double standards that you see so often when it comes to how people treat other people, but how they expect to be treated back. Um, and so I just, I think one of the, the point I'm trying to make here in in a roundabout way, and, and perhaps I'll try and just say it succinctly is that when I look at this passage, you know, I, I think both of our initial responses was, oh, those are wicked, evil people. Mm-hmm. And that's correct. But if I look at how I act, I've never killed or stoned or, well, I have gotten in a few fights, so maybe I have beat one or two people. <laughs> but it was, you know, I wasn't, it was a, it was a fight, not a, not a, you know, um, 
assault. Like, you know, they couldn't defend themselves. Anyways, plus we were in middle school, so it was like we were slapping <laughs> each other. It wasn't even real. Um, but the point is, even though I haven't done those things, the motivations and the reasons for why they've done those things are uh, – have occurred in my life many, 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 many times. That same rationality, that same anger or um, desire to have what is someone else's, um, that, yeah, the uh, the covetousness, the lust, the, uh, the desire to be in control, the desire to be the one that everyone else knows is in control, um, all of that stuff, all the time. I struggle with. And so I read this and I'm like, yeah, those are wicked evil people. I'm like, oh man, I, given the right situation, I don't see how I wouldn't act that way. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, what grabs me the most about this whole thing is because it's such extremes. This giant vineyard, this guy leaves, he sends his servants. Like, it's very um, grand in the scheme, Mm -hmm. but it still gets down to the basic truths of what it is to be a broken human person and how we're going to act in certain situations. And I just, the fact that Jesus does that repeatedly in his teachings and his parables, just it, it really still to this day blows my mind Mm -hmm. that he can be so um, in sync with what's actually going on in people's hearts that are listening or reading. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes. I hope that made sense. Absolutely. Yeah. um, You know, and this was... um, It really doesn't... Really, and I don't know that this particularly matters, but it doesn't necessarily say anything about the character of the man who planted the vineyard. Um, I believe that as Jesus was telling this parable, they would have been familiar with vineyards and how they worked and that sort of thing. Um, But that, and again, I'm not not an expert on these things. Um, He put a fence around it he dug a wine press, and he built a tower. I mean, maybe those are just standard. That's just the way the the vineyard is. But I guess I just get this sense of, here's everything you need. Like, I'm not, you know, I haven't given you this <laughs> piece of junk land to, but no, there's, there's a fence around it. So protected. To protect it. Uh, you know, the wine press is there. Um, again, I don't know. And then the tower, I'm assuming, again, is for security and things like that. So, um, kind of back to what, I guess, what what you're saying in terms of um how they responded to him being very much the way we behave. Uh, I don't get the, the, the way the parable is told. I don't get the impression that this guy was a bad man. You know, like there's, there, there's not that leap there that it's definitely that the, the sinful nature of the tenants, much like it's our sinful nature. Um, when God has given us so many blessings and so many uh, different elements to what we need and it is it's we we get focused on the wrong things yeah and you know i get the feeling like as you said he set them up for success that's a good yes and thank then, you and then left it in their hands fully confident that they would take care of it if this guy was a bad man he would not have left them the way they did and they probably wouldn't have had the guts to cross him yeah that yeah especially with his son Right. Unless they're part of the, you know, the other family in town. But, (laughs) like, you get the impression, and I think you said it accurately, that, yeah, he set them up for success, he trusted them with what he left them, and then they double-crossed him. You, I wouldn't imagine they would do that to 
you know, the local mob boss. Like, that's just, that's a death wish, right? Right. But to the local generous, you know, person, they always seem to be the ones that get taken advantage of the most. Yes. And if we're going to draw conclusions from this parable about who the the tenants are and who the uh, vineyard owner is, then we're going to draw the conclusion that the vineyard owner is God, who's not a bad guy. No. He's just, and he will have his justice served. He's not a bad guy. Right. And the tenants are us. Or, in, in very specific terms, the leaders of the Jewish church who then turn and murder God's son. And he says, oh, okay, I'll send my son. They'll listen to him. And they're like, nah, we're just going to kill you because we like what we have. You know, we've got the temple. We've got the priesthood. We've got all this stuff. We like it the way we have it. And you're not going to tell us any different. Mm -hmm. And it's, I don't know how to feel about that because obviously God knew what was going to happen when he sent Jesus. Mm -hmm. Sent him anyways. Yep. Which is at best kind of a head scratcher and at worst utterly confusing. <laughs> yes. Um, But at the same time, and I totally lost my train of thought, Dave. Oh, no. Where was I going? Um, all right, I'm tapping out, man. You, I totally can't remember. I just had a major brain <laughs> fart. That is so unprofessional. <clears throat> so I, I, I guess one of the questions that I had and have probably had for some time is, is there a par a parallel uh between um his servants coming and like the prophets and folks of the old testament is there an element here of i've i've sent multiple people and they have not listened to multiple people and so i will send my son yeah i i would certainly think of that as an accurate um statement and if you look at the progression first they beat one then they killed one. Then they stoned one. Mm -hmm. Like, when you stone a person, there is, there is malice and intent there. Yeah. I mean, just killing someone is awful and wrong. But then doing it by beating them to death with rocks? That's just brutal. And it's usually a mob of people that are doing it. Right. So it's not just, like, one angry guy that's torturing them. It's this entire group of people that are just essentially bludgeoning this guy until he dies. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you can see the, the, the escalation of the violence towards who these people represent. Mm -hmm. And I would absolutely think that that, um, correlates to God sending the prophets in the old Testament and the people listening less and less and less until he sent Jesus. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, I guess the, he didn't really, there, there weren't, none of the prophets were really killed, were they? Or, I mean, I guess I'm, that's probably one thing I just am not real familiar is what. John the Baptist. That's true. Was beheaded. <laughs> and, yeah, presented on a silver platter. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that. That is a good. And then all the disciples after Jesus, outside of John. Right. Was just who was just exiled like that doesn't suck. Um, I, I think he would have been very glad with being dead because <laughs> it's not being dead. But I think he'd have been fine with. Yeah, my time's up. Um, I'm trying to think of. Uh, well, Saul, he died in the battlefield, but he wasn't a prophet. He was just king. Um, and then. David was king. So I'm, I'm on the king trail now, but I'm thinking like um, Samuel and Nathan and like Hosea and Isaiah and all those folks. I can't, I can't remember if any of them were 
brutally murdered or not, but definitely rejected at certain points. Yeah, and just even the fact that there was a king, I mean, that wasn't even God's... I mean, he was, God was to be king, and the people clamored for a king, and so he gave him a king. So yeah, there's, there's this... You know, it's... It, it, and I don't think, you know, when you think about God in the Old Testament, I think people tend to have this idea of, okay, he was the venf- vengeful God of wrath, which is true, but there's like time and time again... He, he, I don't know if this is the best word, but he gives in to what the people want. You know, they kind of clamor for different things. And he's like, well, that's not really my plan. This is the way I'm going. And then eventually he's like, okay, that's what you want. You can deal with the natural consequences of <laughs> what's going to happen when you get your way. Yeah. Well, it's, it's kind of like the parent who, uh, you know, catches their kids smoking when they're like 16 and mm-hmm. then forces them to smoke a whole pack in like a half hour. So the kid just pukes his guts out. <laughs> like, if you want to do it, go for it. Go big or go home. And then, you know, let that be a lesson to you why that's a dumb thing to do. Uh, I'm not saying that's maybe the best parenting tactic out there. Um, but, but natural consequences for... Yeah. Yeah. Letting letting the uh, the child, or in this case, the servants, feel the consequences of the road they're heading down. And, um, you know, whether that's the parent saying, don't touch the oven, it's hot, and then you touch it anyways and you get burned. I was the kid that, that took two fingers to the lighter in the car to realize that orange meant really hot. <laughs> that's, that's where I started, Dave. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so anyways, so we get to the point where he says, all right, I'm going to send my son because they will respect him. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance, as if it were that simple. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I find interesting, and I, you know, I did not do the Greek work this week. I'm sorry. I don't know what term for respect is being used here. But I have to believe this guy realizes that respect has gone out the window the second they beat one of his tenants, let alone killed or stoned one. Um, so the fact that he says they will respect my son, I find a very peculiar choice of words mm-hmm. because I feel like it, respect is, is gone. And I also wonder if this is, you know, just like God sent Jesus to die, God kind of playing um, coy with the tenets. Like, I already know what you're going to do, but I know that it has to be done in order to, you know, set things right. Um, you know, it reminds me of the scene in um, Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe when Aslan turns himself over right. to the witch. Yeah. And she starts quoting the, you know, the deep magic, and he gets all, don't quote the deep magic to me. Blah, blah. And then she gets all excited, and they kill him, and they're like, oh, I can't believe we want it. And then, you know, he comes back, and, you know. <laughs> Don't give it away. Oh, please. <laughs> yeah, if you haven't seen or read that, then, you know, that's that's not my fault. Uh, <laughs> see me dodge that bullet right there? Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, just the, the, the over-eagerness of the sinful party to have what they want. They don't realize they they don't realize that they're swallowing the bait, as it were. And there's a big old hook in there that is uh, gonna end in a result that they don't want. Um, but it is the natural consequence of the sinful action taken to the final stage. Right. And I think that that is a trick that I feel like the devil plays in my life a lot. You know, as someone who is a Christian, has been for a long time, is educated in theology and scripture, um, and has, you know, worked for the church. I know all of this. I know it all really well. Mm -hmm. But the devil is so good at saying, well, it's just this little, you're just, you're just taking an inch. 
and you know the big hook isn't in that inch, so why not just take that inch? You know the big hook is three feet down the line, so why don't you just inch your way towards it? You'll know when you can stop because you're smart. You know the Bible. You know that God will forgive you. You know that just taking an inch here and an inch there is really, it's just a little sin. It's really not that bad. You're not like those people that, you know, cheat on their wives or or don't pay taxes or, uh, you know, murder people or, you know, all these just, you know, sins that are truly terrible. But what I tell myself is that my sins aren't so terrible because I'm a good person and I know the Bible, which is the most ridiculous logic because if I am a good person and I know the Bible, then I shouldn't be doing those things. But I use that as a twisted way to be like, it's okay, which is, you know, welcome to, you know, my psychosis, Dave. (laughs) Keeps me up at night sometimes. It's a good time to pray. That's the time I don't want to pray (laughs) because I'm ashamed. That's the best time you should. I well I I know that in th- I know a lot of things in theory, Dave. That's I'm very good at theory. Uh-huh. It's, it's it's the practical side of things that tends to be a little sticky. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, you know, in this this um, as we're reading this verse, and I just I, I thinking even just to you know, God put Adam and Eve in the garden. Sin came. That, you know, it wasn't his plan, but he had to know it was going to happen. You know, and just throughout um, our history, and I don't know that there's, well, I don't believe there's been anything since Jesus was crucified and, and rose from the dead. I don't, I don't believe there's been anything. But I just, I, I have this just sense of, God participating with us in life throughout the beginning of time. And um, I don't even know exactly where I'm going with this, but well, I I even feel like there's like this, he's God. So why does he keep letting us screw it up? Why does he keep allowing this? Cause, cause I'm kind of, you're kind of that way with the, with the guy in the vineyard. Like you keep sending your the t- your servants. Send, yeah, send the militia in already. Take yeah. these guys out and reclaim what's yours. Yeah. And and then you're gonna do that, and then you send your son. And it's like, but if I look at history and what led up to to Jesus crucifixion, it was it's very much that way of God just time and time again allowing our sinfulness to sort of ruin us and. I know he exists with the eternal perspective, but, and we've said this before, it's just, I wouldn't do it that way. (laughs) You know, it's like, ah, why does it have to be so much, you know, bad and kind of being in it and, and, and having to, um, exist with bad things happening. And it just seems like it'd be so easy for him to make everything nice and wonderful. Yeah, and, and I think your choice of easy there is a great word choice because uh-huh. we all want things to be easy. But if you read scripture, there's not a single easy thing about what God tells us life is. Right. And, you know, uh, I don't know. I get one of the things I am, I have been thinking about a lot as I'm, you know, preparing to to be a dad is how am I going to teach my kid what right and wrong is and this whole idea of fairness. And I see a lot of parents, right or wrong, um, trying to teach their kids to be fair, you know, to one another. Mm -hmm. And everyone needs to share and everyone gets equal time, you know, do like you get to pick tonight, you get to pick tomorrow night, you each get 20 minutes on the Nintendo. Like wh- however it shakes out. This this teaching children that fairness is expected and is a way of life. And I get that it's a way to like manage the chaos of children. Mm-hmm. But I I can't help but and I'm really not judging people that do this cuz my parents did it and I'll probably wind up doing it just to like manage. But I'm struggling with that concept because what I know of life and what I know of what God tells us life is going to be like, there's, there's nothing fair about it. And we're lucky there's nothing fair about it. 
because yeah, we go through <laughs> we go through the crap, but guess what? If fairness was the rule, Jesus never would have come. Yeah. Or if he did, he would have come in judgment and not yeah. in salvation. So we can't we can't um complain that life isn't easy and life isn't fair. And then also expect it to be that way. Like it's Am I making any sense? Like, I feel like I can't say what I want to say because I can't quite put words to it, which is super frustrating because I'm usually okay with words. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, just this idea that somewhere along the line, we feel like we're getting sh- the short end of the stick for whatever reason. Maybe your life is full of tragedy, mm-hmm. and that sucks. Um, my life hasn't been. I mean, there's been a few crappy things that have happened, but overall, I mean, I'm a white male living in America that grew up in the upper middle class and still lives in the upper middle class. In the history of mankind, outside of being a one percenter, I've got it the best you can have it. Yeah. Unfortunately, because it's, I mean, it's, it's to the detriment of pretty much every other group on the planet that you know white males have it so good um but i just this idea of fairness and equity even though we do crap like this all the time what this passage says Mm -hmm. it is crazy it's crazy i think so i don't know yeah and it's um (laughs) Boy, I'm 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 I haven't mentioned him in a while, but I'm coming back to Dallas Willard and uh, the Divine Conspiracy, and he, you know, there's this. Uh, he talks about he the illustration at the beginning talks about the fighter pilot that's flying upside down, and she thinks she's flying the right way, and basically nose dives into the ground. Uh, that's how he opens the book, right? I think so, and. Um, and then just this idea of, you know, just even on, on college campuses, and I can't remember how old this book is. Um, Divine Conspiracy? Yeah. But just talking about on, co- on college campuses and, and how even, um, you know, things like morality and philosophy um, are starting t- to break down because you basically have to accept everybody and anything that they believe. And it is, I mean, I think we are just, experiencing the extreme of that today um there's part of me that goes i can't imagine it getting much worse than it is but i'm sure we will will. um but yeah so that i just i guess as as you were saying what you were saying i just i i think we're flying upside down in so many ways of you know you take something as simple like you're saying this idea of you got two kids in your home that you're raising and you try to make things fair between the two of them. And it's like on a very basic level, that is not biblical at all. It is like truly one of the worst things that we could be imparting as a value to our kids. And I I guess I'm like you, it's like, I would never judge anybody for it. I get why we do it to a certain, I mean, I get it. But if if you really play it out, it's like we we we're, you're setting people up for this false expectation because the very parent that you know is doing this when they're three, four, five, six, seven is suddenly when they're fifteen going to go well life's not fair, and it's like uh, but mom dad you're the one that up to this point has have kind of been teaching me that life is fair, that, you know, he gets this and I get that. And so I I don't know that I'm making the point that I want to make either, but yeah, it it is. I just think the things that uh, it is very easy for us to fly upside down and hold on to values that really are never biblical values. You know, Jacob, I love Esau. I hated. I mean, I just, I can't think of equality anywhere in the Bible. You know, I just, 
in very strong language generally of any time I come across somebody. I mean, there's very much this element of God's kind of like, I like you. I'm going to bless you. I don't like you. I'm going to harden your heart, you know? And we want to go, that's not fair. And God says, nope, it's not. But you don't want fair. <laughs> you can't handle fair. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, it's all right. Divine Conspiracy came out in 98. 98. Okay, so, gosh, that's almost 20 years ago. It's kind of a little bit scary just to think about what the next 20 years is going to be. So, because, you know, it, it, here's one of the things I will just say, and I, it, it, um, I'm not even wanting to get into the debate of this. I just, to me, this is a concrete example of, how quickly things have have turned in this country, and that's the the gay marriage issue, and the right to be married. I mean, that was not that long ago that people would have not supported that, and it seems like in a very quick short time that has been flipped on its head. And again, I'm not. I I really don't want to even. Um. Well, I'll just say this: you can't expect you can't expect non-Christians to act like Christians, and I think that's so often where we're coming from. Um, again, in that our I think our world is upside down. Well, and to be fair, I don't think you can expect most Christians to act like Christians when it comes to politics or, <laughs> you know, issues like that, mm -hmm. because oftentimes. And I'm going to tread very carefully here because it's a very tumultuous political uh, culture right now. Oftentimes, you see people act as Christians when it's convenient. And then when what you really believe comes under fire, that's when your political um, assertions drag your Christianity along with it to make your political point. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that happened a lot with the, um, the legalization of homosexual marriage. I think there was a lot of dirt thrown from both sides. Oh yeah. In the name of God. <laughs> and it, it's in those moments when you think this is an opportunity for the church to stand and represent God's truth. And mm, most of the time it turns into an opportunity for the church to look like a bunch of jerks, idiots. Yeah. And that's the nicest way I can put it. And I just, I don't know, man. I don't, I hate church bashing. I don't like, cause it doesn't solve anything. It doesn't solve the problem. Um, but I think like this parable, like what God has done with Jesus and like God is doing with all of us from the beginning of time until now, he is letting us make our mistakes and stew in them. And he is still able to turn all things for his glory. And you know what I got to say, you know, I've seen a lot of good twists and turns and movie plots and TV shows, and I've seen lots of good finales and everything. But when we get to heaven <laughs> and we look at what he has accomplished from all of the crap that we have pulled off, it has got to, it's, it's going to be one of the best, like, oh my gosh, mind blown moments of all time. Mm-hmm. Like someone's head might actually explode, but it'd be okay because he would just bring him right back to life. But if you just genuinely think about all of the terrible, awful, horrible things that we have done to each other. Oh, yes. In the name of God or not, just in the history of mankind, all of the awfulness and sin and evil that has occurred. And God is going to, in the end, tie it all up in a nice little bow and throw it down into hell with Satan I mean, that's going to be the biggest climax of any story ever. And mm -hmm. 
I think at that moment, if I can just project, I think that's when all of us are going to go, oh, I get it now. <laughs> uh... And that's when I think when you read in heaven how it says the angels never stop singing his praise. How, how is that not, how, how, is, how is any other reaction appropriate? Mm-hmm. for what you've just witnessed. It, I mean, if you think about it that way, like, yeah, duh. He really is, he really was in control. He really was loving. He really was kind. He really was just. And he has taken the history of sin and expunged it right in front of our eyes. So that's going to be pretty sick. Uh, Luke 7, uh, verse 36. The little title that has been put in there, it's called A Sinful Woman Forgiven. And I'm not going to read this whole thing, and I will um, let those who want to check this out. But uh, Simon, who he's a guest of, basically says, if this man, referring to Jesus, were a prophet, he would have known who and what sort of a woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And there's some back and forth, and then there's kind of a longer uh, statement by Jesus. And then just Luke seven forty seven, he says, therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. And then he looks at her and says, your sins are forgiven. And uh, I think so often we are Simon going, oh, if they only knew who this person really was. And (laughs) Jesus is going, yeah, (laughs) you just still don't get it. (laughs) So anyway, hopefully that's fitting it fit in my head. But yeah, definitely. So uh, the tenants kill the son, and they throw him out of the vineyard, and that's where we'll leave it for this episode. We'll pick up the back half of this parable next episode. Um, we do want to say thanks for listening, um, especially through my brain fart and, and some ramblings, but um, hopefully you found episode 75 to be of um, a high standard. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. But more importantly, no, honestly, I mean, we... We always, you know, try and remember that this, this, these discussions are about honoring God's word and representing his truth faithfully. That doesn't mean that we are always right, and it doesn't mean that we always do those two things. Um, but that's what we're trying to do. And hopefully you guys, you know, to this point after 75 episodes, realize that that's what we're trying to do. And so when, when we make statements... That's what we're trying to do. Um, and one of the reasons why we encourage you guys to reach out to us and, um, and, and converse with us is because we know that we don't always do that. So um, if you want to uh, get in a conversation with us about what we talk about this episode, you can do so on Twitter or email. Dave is 10-8-HBO, or H the only number, and I am at Cam Brennan, C-A-M-B-R-E-N-N-A-N in case you needed to know that. Uh, you can email us at hello at supermegacorp.net and definitely go check out the show notes at supermegacorp.net slash masterclass slash 75 or if you're listening on your uh, podcast app of choice, you can probably just scroll on down below the artwork and that'll be right there for you. We'll be back next time, hopefully next week. Mm-hmm. but definitely next time with episode 76 and the back half of this parable. See you, Dave. Bye.